Gene Smith, an American historian, authored a book entitled When the Cheering Stopped. The book told of Woodrow Wilson and the events surrounding World War I. At the end of the war, people were very optimistic. They believed the war had been fought, and their dream was that the world at last had been made safe, paved the way for democracy and freedom everywhere. They thought it was the last war ever. When Wilson paid his first visit to Europe afterwards, he was greeted by large crowds, cheered every place he went. In many people's eyes, he was more popular than the greatest war heroes throughout the land. He was viewed as an icon of hope. And all the cheering lasted about a year. And then it began to stop. The political leaders all throughout Europe were more interested in their own agendas than a lasting peace, and people began to slowly lose hope. On the home front, Wilson met opposition in the Senate, and his League of Nations was never ratified. Under tremendous stress, his health began to deteriorate. The next election, his party lost, and Wilson, almost two years earlier, who had been a herald as a hero, came to his last days as a broken and defeated man. Four generations before Jesus was born, there was a man named Judah Maccabee. He was called a hammer. He was a fairly righteous man. He was upset that the Syrians occupied the city of Jerusalem. He was angry, and so he rallied an army of Jewish men to decide to fight against the Syrians. To winning many battles in 163 B.C., he entered Jerusalem riding on a massive stallion. And the people shouted and waved palm branches and cheered, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Judah was a hero, and many thought he was a long-awaited Jewish Messiah. They entered the temple, the tent city, they cleaned out the temple, burned incense and ark of sacrifices, and lit a huge menorah that burned for eight days. To this day, the Jewish faith still celebrates eight days of the Festival of the Lights, or Hanukkah, to celebrate this accomplishment. Not long after that, Judah was killed in battle, buried. He died. When he had come riding into the city, he was greeted by adoring thongs. People waved palm branches and cheered Hosanna, blessed are he who comes in the name of the Lord. Almost everything paralleled what occurred when Christ entered four generations later. Except for one thing. When Judah entered the city, he was mounted on a massive stallion in order to show his majesty and his authority, much like kings would do after winning battles. He intended to set up an earthly kingdom and one that required an earthly kind of power. But in the end, he died. And so did the dream of his earthly kingdom because what is earthly will never really last. Today we, of course, celebrate Palm Sunday, and Scripture counts the time when Jesus rode in the town, not on a massive stallion, but on a donkey. Christ came for our freedom, to gain our freedom, to establish his kingdom, and he did just that, only not in the way that people expected. So let's take a look this morning at the Scripture count, or one of them, on this day here, Matthew 21, 1. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, did Jesus send two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied in a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done, and it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, the colt, a colt the full of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then a multitude who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And he would come into Jerusalem. All the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, 
This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. When things stopped working for Woodrow Wilson the way that people wanted them to, they stopped cheering for him. When Jesus didn't respond to what the people wanted, and did what they thought they wanted him to do, they stopped cheering for him. Judah Maccabee tried to establish a kingdom in the manner that the people wanted, and while he accomplished much, he was not God's king, nor was he eternal and divine. Christ came to establish his kingdom in his godly manner and purpose, only it was not the way the people wanted or expected. So several days later, the shouting went from Hosanna to crucify him. I suppose many times over the years, I've often said that we are blessed to stand on this side of the cross. We stand on the finished side, the victorious side, and we have the word of God in its completeness to instruct us and edify us. And as Jesus entered Jerusalem that Palm Sunday, there were several things he was aware of. One or two was he knew the conditions surrounding the people, what they were living through, and he knew the condition of the people's heart. Jews were under heavy, heavy Roman oppression. There were heavy taxes, heavy restrictions, numerous executions. And they responded in much the same way we would. They were in search of somebody to help them, to lead them, to free them. They desired a king, a conqueror, someone to set them free. They wanted an earthly king. A king who would not only sit on the throne of David, but lead forth in battle against the hated Romans, the oppressive Romans. Jesus was everything they hoped for in a leader. They'd seen his miracles, heard him preach with incredible authority. He was charismatic, he was decisive, he was powerful. Capable of feeding thousands of soldiers and healing the wounded, raising the dead. What army on the face of the earth could stand against such a king? They wanted an earthly king. And surely with power and authority like that, Jesus without a doubt was the one that would set them free. So Jesus came to Jerusalem and the crowds began to cheer. Zeron and Jerusalem, the crowds waved palm branches, a symbol of victory. They shouted, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, quoting Psalm the Hillel, cheering, praising, exalting. But then the cheering stopped. Jesus didn't gather any troops. He didn't lead a revolt. He didn't do what they expected. Instead, he drove money changers out of the temple. He paid tribute to Caesar. He taught that giving out of poverty was more important than giving out of abundance. He said that in order to be great, you must be a servant. Because Jesus knew that an earthly kingdom was not the answer. Jesus knew that only the Father's plan would accomplish what was needed in a very fallen world. Jesus knew that what the people that day, what they needed was the same things we need today. In a fallen and natural world, we need a risen, supernatural king. We find him only in Jesus Christ. He was there for them that day, only they didn't see it. Luke, of course, tells of the same event, but he has another detail to it. Prayed is marching, marching in the town, cheering and shouting. Matthew says the multitudes went before the crowds and followed after. Suddenly... Luke writes that Jesus is overcome. In the midst of all this cheering and exalting, Luke 19. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you, circle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Scripture says he reproached Jerusalem. He wept over it. He knew those people. He loved those people. He foresaw their children being destroyed and their families destroyed. All that would happen in 70 years. So he began to cry, he wept over, but 
He didn't weep over it like we think of weeping. It wasn't a little silent tear running down his cheek. Cheek. The word here means crying aloud, wailing. The original language it literally means vehemently. The kind of crying where your shoulders are shaking and people from far distance can hear your cry. The only other time we hear Jesus crying is at the death of Lazarus and in the garden. He cried out on the cross, but he didn't cry. But crying might have been unusual, at least scripturally, what we saw in Jesus. That's not the only thing that was unusual. Unusual. He was riding on a donkey. None of the Gospels' accounts about the ministry of Christ ever mention him riding any animal to get from one place to another. He must have walked hundreds of miles up and down the land that we now call the Holy Land. There's no mention of him ever riding except for riding in a boat. And Jesus knew what he was going to face as he rode into that city of Jerusalem. So I think his decision to go and follow and be obedient probably was one of the most difficult decisions of his life. And his decision to guide on a donkey was deliberate as well. It was prophesied. Riding into the town as the, and the crowds cheered on the donkey was a public declaration that he was indeed a king. He knew that's what it meant, and the people knew that's what it meant. Only his kingdom was far superior than what the people imagined. Jesus prophesied of the coming destruction of the city, which had indeed happened 70 years later. He wept over them and their families. He said, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. King James says you did not recognize the timing of your visitation. And in this context here, the word visitation literally means to relieve, to come to relieve, if you will. There's a reference to the coming of the Messiah, his promised coming. The same word used in Matthew 25 when Jesus said, I was sick and you visited me. You came to me with relief. And you see the irony? Here's a group of people desiring relief and salvation from oppression and failing to see their opportunity for true relief. They missed Jesus' purpose because they were so focused on their current circumstances they did not see their current condition. They wanted immediate relief. relief. Jesus wanted eternal relief for them. When we're in a trying situation, we want immediate relief. There's nothing wrong in that. We want it now. But we should always seek God's purpose in what's happening in our lives. First, what is he trying to accomplish in me in this time? They wanted deliverance from oppression. Jesus came to deliver them from the bigger problem of sin and depression and oppression of the demonic one. And in their desire to escape the immediate circumstances to have their brand of peace, they missed the fact that they walked in the very presence of the Prince of Peace. When we think about this event, and along with the events coming in the following week, you know, we shake our heads at these people in the crowd. One day yelling Hosanna and praising him, and the next few days later, crucify him. I mean, they really missed it. When you realize, as I said a few days later, that y'all crucified, the very least we should do is shake our heads. I mean, how could they? It's hard to imagine. But we need sometimes to look past our initial response, and I, I don't mean to dismiss they really should have never done that, but there's something I want to miss. I want you to picture yourself in the crowd that day. You've been taught your whole life the Messiah was coming. Popular opinion of the day was the Messiah would set you free from an oppressive government. They had a history of, of the kings overcoming oppressive land come in and rescue them time and time again. Likely they've been taught by a local rabbi that this was going to be set free, misunderstanding the prophecies of the coming Messiah. Just as likely the neighbors and friends would repeat this thinking. Messiah is going to come and set us free and take care of the Romans for us. And your belief was that a Messiah would meet your every need and desire. You're in town because it's the beginning of the Passover. That's why you're there. And God had instituted the Passover way of reminding the people of their deliverance from Egypt. 
Israel will never forget how almighty God had opened the Red Sea for them ahead of Pharaoh's chariots, a supernatural defeat of a concrete enemy. How God had defeated a very real enemy in their day and in their time. In your excitement, you understand a Messiah, you hail him as king, even throwing your coat on the ground for him to ride over, to pave the red carpet, if you will. Matthew 21, 8. The very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Spreading of cloaks was an act of homage for royalty. Jesus was openly declaring to the people he was their king and their Messiah they'd been waiting for. Crowds were welcoming Jesus like a, a god or a conquering hero. That's what they thought. And yet they got to think about what had happened. Why didn't Jesus do what they wanted him to do? After all I've done for God, for the church, and he's not helping me. All I spent on this cloak, now what? We don't know how the owner of the donkey felt afterwards when Jesus gave him his two, two donkeys to ride on one. And today's world, that literally would be like giving up your car. I mean, donkeys were important and they were expensive. I mean, I think when you read it, his heart was in the right place. We do know that Mary, the sister of Lazarus, was willing to anoint Jesus' hair with a fragrance that cost literally a year's wages. Her attitude recognizes Jesus' raising of her brother from the grave as a promise of our resurrection one day. So hers was true worship. Her costly worship was true worship. It was the least she could do. And she looked for nothing in return. Spending precious time with Jesus in his very presence was more than enough for her. We don't serve Christ for what we get out of it. And that said, we get a lot. I mean, eternal life. For an eternity and beauty and glory and God's presence. But we don't serve him for what we get. We worship him for who he is. We don't look for things in return. And, and I don't want to miss that. I don't want to miss the fact that sometimes we expect things out of God because of the things we've done, the things we've given, how much we might have sacrificed. That needs to be done out of Heart of worship. Palm Sunday is all about following Christ, committing to Christ, regardless of what the break brings or the days or the months and the years. That our worship at times should be costly. As Christ rode in town that day, he knew what the following week was to bring. I mean, he deserved this triumphant entry as king. Only he was moving towards his place of rejection. As I said, because we stand on this side of the cross, we can see what God reveals to us in his word, and the following week of Christ reveals much. Before the week was out, Jesus would endure an arrest and trial. He actually went through six trials after his arrest, three religious and three civil. First he went to Annas, then the high priest Caiaphas, and then before the Sanhedrin. Then he went before Pilate, then Herod, and then back again before Pilate. All of this after a draining, emotional garden event, we literally sweated drops of blood. He leaves the garden to go through a whole night of that. Six trials all night. And the result is they had nothing to accuse him of. He had done nothing wrong. They finally convicted him when they convicted him on the truth. Not that they received it as the truth, but Jesus claimed he was the son of God. Matthew 26, tell us if you are Christ, the Son of God. Yes, it is as he say, as you say. And then they spit in his face, struck him with fists, slapped him. It's important to notice that Jesus never claimed to be a good man. He never claimed to be a moral leader. He never claimed to be a great teacher. He said, I'm God. I am the only way to heaven. No one comes to the Father but through me. He was all those things, but he only said he was God. If someone claims a God, it's been said you have three options. 
You believe he's a fool. He's crazy. He's delusional. If somebody walked in there today and came up and said, I'm God, we think he's crazy, right? Or you believe he's a deceiver, a con man, a swindler, someone who's trying to con something out of you or from you. Or you believe he's telling the truth, in which case the only thing that you have left to do is fall down and worship him, obey him, and follow him. Jesus claimed to be deity. John 12. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. If anyone hears my word and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him already, if you will. The, the word which I have spoken will judge him in the last day. He didn't come to be a judge. So many people think, you know, us Christians are so judgmental, and so many times we are. We forget that Jesus said, I came to save the world. So those that are going to be judged needn't be judged at some point when they come through me. We need to adopt that same attitude. And Jesus allowed himself to be put on trial to prove who he was, to accomplish his purpose. He could have stopped at any time. He could have stopped the trial, but his purpose, his plan, was to fulfill his purpose and accomplish his mission. The trial of Jesus showed his purpose. The death of Jesus showed his passion. Romans 5.8, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die while we were still sinners. So I encourage you earlier to read through the Gospels this week and Crucifixion is the most brutal and torturous death penalty ever devised by man. Not to mention, on the cross, Jesus became all of our sin as well. He took all of that upon him. But the physical, torturous, brutal death. Before being nailed to the cross, he would experience incredible beatings and pain. The Bible says he was mocked, scorned, scourged, not whipped. Scourging is a hot, lot worse and more meaningful Bits of bone or metal tied to a whip, whip skin. It's worse than a whipping. I think over the years we've looked at the horrible beating inflicted on Christ, and it's beyond description and understanding. Studying the actual nailing on the cross and a gruesome death that afflicts it, you'll cringe. Every nerve in your body cries out in agony as your lungs scream for air. Scripture tells us the wages of sin is death. It tells us the penalty of sin. But you know, we often forget it doesn't stop there. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's holiness demands justice for the horror and ugliness of sin. God's love demands taking the penalty upon himself. Look at God's creation and you see his hand. Look at the cross, you see his heart. And passion. The trial of Jesus showed his purpose. The death of Jesus showed his passion. Jesus went to the cross not guilty. If he was guilty of anything, it was love of the first degree. We see the cross, we look at the cross and ask, why? Why in the world would anybody ever do this for me? Jesus looks at the cross and he doesn't ask why, he asks who? Who in the world would I do this for, and who is you and me? Isaiah prophesied an incredible prophecy of the coming Christ. Isaiah 53. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, Yet we esteemed him stricken, smit my God, and afflicted. In other words, we think God, you know, he deserved that, people did. But is wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all cross is a true picture of the ugliness of sin, but it's also a picture of the beauty of God's love for you. This astounding, incredible love. 
So the trial of Jesus showed his purpose, the death of Jesus showed his passion, the resurrection showed his power. Romans 1 confirms this. Romans 1, 4. And by being raised from the dead, he was proved to be the mighty Son of God with the holy nature of God himself. After the resurrection, history records Jesus showing himself several times, once to over 500 people. When he rode into Jerusalem on that donkey, imagine for the moment, as we did earlier, the crowd that greeted him. Many of that crowd had seen his miracles. Scripture said they were showing up because they'd heard about Lazarus being raised from the dead, and they were telling everybody. They want to see this. If you look at Scripture, you'll see that. They'd witnessed many. Many had been part of the multitudes, probably. They'd been fed from a few loaves of bread and fish. Most likely, some of the actual people who experienced the miracles were there in the crowd. Certainly, there were those who loved him. Perhaps Bartimaeus was there, a man who received his sight and is no longer in beggar's rags. Lepers, the skin had been cleansed, and now they're rejoicing of the healing that God had given, the Lord Christ had given them. I wonder if Jairus' daughter, who was brought back to life after experiencing death, stood in that crowd. Mary Martha and Mary Magdalene were all there. This is the crowd that stood at the cross later on, many of them. At the cross, there were sinister faces there. Faces with squinty eyes waiting for them to say one wrong thing to make one mistake. Sadducees and Pharisees were there. They watched out of anger and jealousy. The Romans were there fearing revolt and watching for any sign of rebellion against Rome. They were ready to write to crush any uprising. Now imagine the people after the resurrection. Surely many who cried crucify saw the risen Christ. And what and who did they see after the resurrection? I mean, they'd yell crucified. He'd been whipped and beaten and killed and murdered on a cross. Who comes off that cross? Who do they see? An angry Jesus? A Jesus bent on retaliation? No, they found a loving Jesus, a forgiving Jesus. They found a powerful Jesus. They found an eternal king who would bring them eternal peace. The trial of Christ showed his purpose. The death of Jesus showed his passion. The resurrection showed his power. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the people were focused on their circumstances. Jesus was focused on their condition. All too often, we focus on our current circumstance, losing sight of our condition and what God's done for us, what he's going to do. And we need to be reminded that when we know Christ, Whatever our circumstances are, our condition is wonderful and powerful. Romans 3.22, now God says he will accept and acquit us, declare us not guilty if we trust Jesus Christ to take away our sins. We all can be saved in the same way by coming to Christ, no matter who we are or what we have been like. Wow. In Christ we find the peace of God, the righteousness of God, and the eternal love of God. In Jesus, we've been given a new life, not just in the future, but here and now. As we reflect on this week and the coming Resurrection Sunday, I want you to think about this first. Romans 6, 4. For we, the ones that have accepted Christ, died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. To live that resurrected life, to live a life that is free of sin, free of oppression, free of guilt, full of love, full of acceptance, full of promise, full of hope. What a glorious God we serve. Let's never stop cheering on God. I invite the worship team to come forward. We mentioned a few of the people who may have been at the crucifixion. Some of the Bible mentioned, some were Speculation. If Bartimaeus was there, a man who received his sight, he's no longer beggar rags. Like Bartimaeus, we were once blinded to the truth, and our righteousness was as filthy rags. In Christ, our eyes have been opened, our souls cleansed, and we stand righteous before God. 
Like Jairus' daughter, we were once dead to God because of our sin. And through Christ, we've been brought back to life, eternal life. Mary Magdalene was set free from seven demons. We may not have been physically or spiritually possessed, but our lives were under the dominion of Satan. Through Christ, we're free to stand in his authority over all evil. We said there were also sinister faces there that looking with skepticism of the claims of Christ. Through Jesus, we need no longer doubt. We know the truth, and the truth has made us free. If you know Christ as your Lord, then this next week is a wonderful time to reflect on his purpose for you, his passion and love for you, his resurrection life that he wants you to live daily. If you don't know Christ, either this morning here or looking on the Internet later, if you've fallen away, he has a promise for you. That you whoop, wrong button. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that he raised from the dead, you will be saved. That's a promise, is it not? Let's stand together and worship our God this morning.